If you've been tracking the next generation graphics card market, you know it's incredibly expensive, with prices often exceeding the $1,000 mark for the latest and greatest models. For many gamers, enthusiasts, and creators, these prices are just unrealistic, making most brand new GPUs unattainable. So today we'll be focusing on more affordable options that offer solid performance without breaking the bank, and we'll be testing four GPUs in the $250 price range. While they may not have all the bells and whistles of the higher end cards, they can still deliver impressive results and provide a great gaming or content creation experience at a much more reasonable cost. So whether you're in the market for a new graphics card or just curious to see how these affordable options stack up, stick around for some realistic graphics card testing. It's the money. Hey guys, CJ with Elevated Systems, and today we'll be putting four $250 graphics cards to the test in a variety of benchmarks and games to see which one comes out on top in terms of performance and overall value. Let's take a look at the cards we'll be testing today. First up from NVIDIA is the GTX 1660 Super, a 12 nanometer Turing GPU containing 1,408 CUDA cores with a base frequency of 1530 megahertz, boosting up to 1785. Six gigabytes of GDDR6 VRAM on a 192 bit bus. Next up is the AMD Radeon 6600, a seven nanometer Navi 23 GPU containing 1,792 cores, a base frequency of 1626 megahertz, boosting up to 2491 megahertz with eight gigabytes of GDDR6 VRAM on a 128 bit bus. And from Intel, we have the Arc A750, a six nanometer GPU with 3,584 cores, a base frequency of 20. 50 megahertz, boosting up to 2400 megahertz, and 8 gigabytes of GDDR6 VRAM on a 256 bit bus. Now, I did say four graphics cards, and while the first three cards can be had at $250 or below, the final card, while it technically had a launch MSRP of $259, unless you got really lucky, like I happen to, the lowest I've seen it for now is around the $289 mark for the NVIDIA RTX 3050, an eight nanometer ampere GPU with 2,560 cores, a base frequency of 1552 megahertz, boosting up to 1777 megahertz, and eight gigabytes of GDDR6 VRAM on a 128 bit bus. Also, this is an RTX card, so unlike the GTX card, this does have 80 Tensor and 20 RT cores, so supports hardware ray tracing and DLSS. So while today this isn't a $250 card, the price has been falling, so in a month or two, it might be back to its launch price. I'll be testing them all in a realistic or budget appropriate system. Instead of plugging these $250 cards into a $2,000 test system, we're testing them in a $600 system that's a realistic representation of the types of PC for someone who's buying a GPU at this price point. Now, I completely understand the point of testing graphics card with the best possible CPU, memory, motherboard, and drives to remove any possible system bottlenecks and demonstrate their absolute best possible performance. I've tested GPUs like that before, and you can find dozens of reviews of all of these cards that use that method. But I wanna demonstrate how these cards will perform in a realistically priced PC. I also wanna build a system that's representative of the kinds of PCs most gamers are currently using. So I went to the Steam system hardware survey, which yes, I'm aware is not perfect, but that told me almost all gamers are still on DDR4 system. So instead of using my Ryzen 7600X system, I went with an Intel 13400F cooled with a deep cool AK400 air cooler with 16 gigabytes of DDR4 3200 memory, a one terabyte gen three NVMe SD on a B660 motherboard. I went a bit overkill as usual with a 750 watt Corsair power supply and it's all in a fractal meshify two mini. I also tested all of these cards at their out of the box settings, no undervolting or overclocking. The only change I made was increasing the power limit to each card's maximum to match the MSI 1660 Super, that's factory set to a max power limit. And of course, resizable bar was enabled in the UFEI. It's actually on by default on most new motherboards. I'm also using the latest drivers for each card. 
Let's start testing with some quick content creation benchmarks and looking at the average of three Blender GPU renders, we see that the Intel A750 and the RTX 3050 performing statistically dead even with the RX 6600 falling 38% behind and the 1660 Super 48% behind. Looking at the performance in the Adobe Creative Suite, these results are based on total system performance with the slight differences being represented of the GPU's contribution to the workflows. And in the photo editing test, we see the RTX 3050 take about a 7% lead on the A750 with the other two cards falling behind by up to 12%. While in Premiere Pro, the Iris XE media engine in the A750 has the advantage with the GTX 1660S actually outperforming the newer RTX 3050. But to keep this test in perspective, that 12.5% score difference between the two NVIDIA card equals just a 57 second difference in the total render times of the four test timelines. Moving on to the gaming performance, it's important to note that these cards are marketed and intended as 1080p gaming GPUs. However, I did test all the games at both 1080p and 1440p. I also chose graphics presets that I estimated would keep the frame rates above the 60 FPS threshold. And unless otherwise noticed, I didn't tweak those presets. Starting with a couple of synthetics, and in Time Spy Extreme, we see the Intel cards score 35% higher than the next closest GPU, the RX 6600, while the Nvidia cards are pretty even but fall 22% behind the AMD card. Looking at the Port Royal ray tracing test, this time the A750 scores 63% higher than the RX 6600, while the RTX 3050 falls 16% short of the 6600. And weirdly, although the GTX 1660 Super doesn't have ray tracing abilities, it was able to run the test, but not in a meaningful way. Now, to explain these scores, this is a speed versus power chart because these synthetic benchmarks rely almost completely on the speed and power of the GPU. And while we see the RX 6600 hit 6% higher clock speeds during the time spy test, the A750 69% higher power draw gives it the edge in the 3D Mark benchmarks while the NVIDIA cards alternate better speed for more power, leading to the equal scores. And if we take the time spy score and divide it by the total system power, we get the performance per watt, and we'd see the RX 6600 is the most efficient card by about 10%, while the RTX 3050 is the least. But speed and power are only a couple of the factors that contribute to a GPU's actual performance, there are many more like architecture, game optimization, and driver implementation. So let's take a look. In Assassin's Creed Valhalla at 1080p very high, a game that definitely favors Radeon architecture, the RX 6600 takes a decisive 28% lead over the next closest A750, with the Nvidia cards falling by up to 37% behind the AMD card. Moving to 1440p high, the A750 closes the gap on the 6600 at just 8% behind, while the Nvidia cards are slightly better by up to 36% behind the 6600. In Borderlands 3 1080p Ultra, the Intel and AMD cards are dead even, with the GTX 1660 and RTX 3050 falling 43 and 37% respectively. But the A750 did provide the smoothest gameplay, with 35% better 1% lows. At 1440p medium, the NVIDIA cards closed the gap on the RX 6600, with the 3050 scoring 9% higher than the 6600, but the A750 takes a huge jump coming in 51% over its next closest competitor. Now, looking at a DirectX 9 title, CSGO, we see while Intel has made improvements in its driver support for older DX9 titles, the A750 still trails the pack. Also, here we see the older GTX 1660 Super slightly outmatches the newer 3050 in the older game. The 1440p results are very similar, but here the A750 does manage to just outpace the 3050. In Cyberpunk 2077, the high preset does employ FSR at the quality setting, which I did leave and it definitely gave the AMD card an advantage here in a game that already favors AMD architecture. But here we see the GTX card comes in second, 16% ahead of the 3050 and 20% ahead of the A750. 
The results are almost the same at 1440p medium. FSR auto is applied here, but here the A750 just barely edges out the GTX 1660 Super, which in turn still beats the 3050 by 23%. In F1 2020 Ultra, again, the RX 6600 takes a significant lead with the ARC, GTX, and RTX cards falling 40, 47, and 54% respectively. And again, the GTX card outperforms the RTX card. At 1440p high, the results are similar. However, the RTX 3050 does flip the percentage on the GTX 1660S. In God of War 1080p high, the RX 6600 pulls ahead of the GTX 1660 by 22%, with the A750 falling behind the 3050 by 8%. At 1440p original, the performance gap tightens up for all the cards, with the A750, 1660S, and 3050 statistically even. In our Vulcan title, Red Dead Redemption 2, at 1080p balanced, or 9 ticks up the quality slider, we see the RX 6600 pull ahead of the A750 by 26%, with the NVIDIA cards, which are tied, coming another 20% down. But at 1440p favor performance, or 6 ticks up the slider, we see the A750 take a 9% lead over the 6600, with performance falling by another 11 or 12% as we move down the chart. In Shadows of the Tomb Raider, 1080p highest preset, again, the RX 6600 has a 15% advantage over the A750, with the Nvidia cards falling by up to 37% to AMD. At 1440p medium, however, the A750 does take a slight advantage over the RX 6600, while the Nvidia cards narrow the gap to about 22%. For Call of Duty Warzone, this is the only game I adjusted an individual setting as some of these presets reduced the render resolution to 50%. I just ensured they were set to 100% of the tested resolution. So at 1080p basic, the AMD card has a 28% higher frame rate than the Intel card, and here we see the newer R RTX card take a measurable 17% jump over the GTX card. At 1440p minimum, again 100% render resolution, the results tighten a bit as we're more GPU bottlenecked, but are relatively the same. In the upgraded The Witcher 3 1080p Ultra, again the RX 6600 is the decisive frontrunner, scoring 22% higher than the A750, which in turn outscored the pretty even Nvidia cards by up to 15%. However, at 1440p medium, the A750 pulls ahead of the AMD card by 12%, with the RTX 3050 slightly increasing the gap between the 1660 Super. For overall averages, I eliminated CSGO just to keep the numbers in a realistic FPS range, and at 1080p, the RX 6600 comes in on top with a 34% better FPS in the nine tested games, with the A750 outscoring the Nvidia cards, which finished in a dead heat by 16%. At 1440p, the A750 narrowed the gap with the RX 6600 to just 10%, while the RTX 3050 did beat the 1660 Super by 8%, but still fell to the Intel card by 23%. Now, for the most part, this was straight rasterization performance. However, most of these cards have both ray tracing and upscaling technology available, but at this tier, neither provide much value. As far as ray tracing, I don't even have a chart for it. I did test it, but first, the GTX 1660 doesn't have RT cores, so no ray tracing ability. And the others, I started testing in Cyberpunk, but enabling the lowest level of ray tracing immediately dropped the FPS from the 60s down into the 20s and 30s. Same when I tried the new ray tracing features in The Witcher 3. In order to get playable frame rates with RTX enabled, I had to drop the texture quality or resolution so low it completely invalidated the visual gains anyway. Basically, if you're into the extra visuals you get with ray tracing, you really need to save a bit longer for a higher tier card. As far as upscaling, FSR, XESS, DLSS, if you aren't expecting huge FPS gains, you can get some decent performance improvement with these cards. For example, in God of War, if you're looking to be able to play at 1440p high with smooth gameplay, enabling performance mode in each of the card's native technologies did deliver good frame rates. 
The same was true in Warzone where implementing upscaling can give you an FPS advantage with a moderate hit to visual fidelity. In the end, this testing seemed to turn into two distinct battles, AMD versus Intel and the two Nvidia cards against each other. And that's not because Nvidia makes worse cards, it's just because they price their cards higher. The card that performance wise belongs in this testing is the RTX 3060, but those go for $350 or more. And this is the best $250 graphics card video. So as I'm assuming the majority of y'all watching are gamers for a straight gaming PC, the clear winner is the RX 6600, both in 1080p and 1440p gaming. Now for content creators, it's a little more unclear. In the past, I've always recommended Nvidia cards for content creators because the content creation software is designed almost completely for CUDA hardware acceleration. And if you're an expiring 3D artist, Nvidia is still the way to go as viewport and final render engines like Optics, V-Ray, Corona, and others are still reliant on CUDA. However, given the results here, if you're a photo or video editor, the A750 is a compelling option as many of these applications have already been optimized to use Intel's iGPU architecture, which the art cards are an evolution of. I would avoid AMD consumer cards for content creation if they've never really had the driver development or software optimization for content creation suites. Finally, if you are a creator and a gamer using your system to slay timelines by day and tryhards by night, then I may look at the Intel card as it gave the best balance and performance in both areas. No matter which way you go, there are pros and cons. AMD cards tend to have more driver issues over a longer period of time. However, for the most part, it seems the drivers for the 6000 series GPUs have been worked out. The Nvidia cards have higher price points, giving them much worse price to performance. And the Intel cards are just really new. First gen hardware has issues. And while the 3D Mark scores indicate that the A750 has the potential to be a beast in gaming at this price point, the lack of game optimization by developers and driver maturity hinders its actual gaming performance. It's also hot. While all the other cards peaked in the mid 70s, the A750 hit 102 degrees Celsius in time spy extreme. So which card is the best bang for your buck? Let us know in the comments. Thanks for watching and as always, be sure to like, subscribe and hit that notification bell to stay up to date on all our latest content. And I'll see you in the next one.